five years ago, I believed you had to be a jack of all trades if you wanted to be successful. You had to understand all the individual pieces of the widget, right? You had to know everything about something and something about everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that's fine. Today, given the advancements in technology, given the efficiencies that have now been created through AI, which have reduced you know, engineer and legal workforces for the better or worse, um, uh, given the innovation and the global marketplace we have, I'm actually a much bigger believer today in just being uniquely qualified to doing what you do best and going all in, like we talked about an hour ago, going all in on what you, you are uniquely qualified to do um, and then diversifying and leveraging yourself out amongst people who are way more qualified than you are at those individual things. Um, because I would rather be everything to someone than, than nothing to no one. <laughs>
about the awareness that I was creating for myself or or for the product. And that that foundationally is how I think about brand. I think you're spot on and you're in good company because a lot of the smartest people who have talked a lot about brand have said the same exact thing. A brand is a shorthand for what you represent and the experience, right? And oftentimes the brand doesn't really live in us. Yep. It lands and lives in the people with whom you have experiences or touch points. Yep. So, you know, uh, for, for better or for worse, that can be your frontline employees. That can be, you know, the people who, you know, uh, this is a touch point, you know, the new book, or could be one of your um, reps or your, you know, team members out there in the field. If whoever's wearing the Sirhant, you know, badge, yep. people have a, an opportunity to have an impression. And that's what lives inside the hearts and minds of the people. And so, yeah, I love that you took us through that exercise of, you know, talking about values and establishing all that. Um, so that said, what is the Ryan Sirhan brand? So one of the exercises that I do with people, um, because a lot of what the book is, isn't just me sitting around thinking about brand. It's, it's the fact that I've been working on my own personal brand and then my company's brand for 15 years. So everything that I've learned in building our brands. And, you know, we started an education business for salespeople uh, based off my first book, which was Sirhan uh, in 2018. And we started that business in 2019. And what a lot of people started coming to us for was, yeah, we, we want to learn how to sell more, but I also want to have a brand. I want to be the one who, the one who does X. I want more people to know me because at the end of the day, you can have the greatest brand ever, but if no one knows what you're selling, yeah, you're not going to make any money. Yeah. And so how do I generate lead flow? You know, which is, what it's all about. How do I create more customers? How do I create more content to create more potential clients? Um, and how do I do that in my sleep so I don't have to sit there doing outbound lead generation all day? I can have inbound. I want to be stopped on the street, the coffee shop, and I want to wake up with leads in my inbox. Um, uh, and so one of the exercises that we work with people on, which is part of kind of our core identity phase one, um, and if you go through the book, uh, we, I, what I have in there is, is what I call the Sirhan brand strategy system. Yep. And it's separated into three phases, which is core identity, consistent content and amplification. Um, kind of what I call like shouting success from the mountaintop. And it just, and it's how to do everything. It's literally just a tactical manual. And so in that core identity phase to answer your question in a long way, um, uh, there's an exercise called your and to make things really, really simple, right? So you are or I am, you asked me about me, I am real estate and what, like, what is, what is my passion? You've got to have an and you can't just be real estate. You can't just be cats, right? You can't just be your kids. You can't just be fitness. Like you, it, it, it's what and what, where, what is, what is the, what is the tactical product that you're connecting yourself to? And then what is that passion that people can emotionally relate to? All right. Let me push back on that a little bit. Cause it's, I'm curious. Sure. Um, why do I have to have an and why can't I just be like, uh, you should ask me what I think the Sirhan brand is. Oh, well, what do you, yeah, what do you think the Sirhan brand is? I see you as the king of real estate East Coast. Okay. Full stop. Oh, interesting. Okay. Is that, uh, is that, on, uh, you know, is that off? Is that on? Is that accurate? I think if you, sure, I, I'll take that. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I think if I, if I'm pitching us though, because like when I started the company, I couldn't just rest on the foundation of I'm the best at real estate on the East Coast because there's a lot of competition on the East Coast. And so what's my differentiator? Yeah. Um, and my differentiator was then media. So we were the first real estate company, uh, I guess, on the East Coast that then had an in-house production company, like yes. separate C-Corp, separate everything. So we had studios that for free created organic content for the agents, the properties, and the developers to drive that organic lead flow across a large platform. And so the company was was really put out as media and real estate. Mm -hmm. And so for me personally, right, I am luxury real estate and media as a as a differentiator. Yeah. And if people if people only see the real estate side, no problem. A lot of people only see the media side. Well, I guess um, I'm looking at it from well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The media side is attractive only to 
your team. So if I'm an agent and I'm looking for a home, yeah. I want to be with Sirhan because he's the king of real estate on the East Coast and he can help me build my personal brand. I can be a sure. protege of yeah. Ryan Sirhan and, and do media like he's done it. I don't think that really applies, you tell me, how, to clients who want to come, you know, I want to buy a $10 million apartment. I don't yeah. care if you have a media company. So interesting you say that. Um, you know, there's two types of clients that we work with in the sales space, clients that buy things and clients that sell things. Mm -hmm. And so on the buy side, they're appreciative of the media because it can hopefully get us access to more inventory that they wouldn't ordinarily get access to. Yeah. But then for us, a lot of times we get access to that buyer through the media because that guy's 12 year old follows us on YouTube, yeah. right? And says, dad, if you're gonna go get an apartment or a new house, you need to work with Sirhant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the buy side. On the sell side, a lot of our clients now write it into our exclusive contracts that they will get an in-feed Instagram post. Right, right, right. Do, and they, they, they're like, well, if I'm gonna go with you guys, then I wanna have all the firepower. Absolutely. And so we yeah. have to work, we have to figure out hosting schedules and our real estate deals now, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's, it's just, it's part of it and how it works. Yeah. I love that. So it's an influencer deal, but you're working yeah, kind from of, the inside. It's house. Yeah. It's yeah. Part, listen, we are sales. People are, are part of that, that gig economy. Mm -hmm. Like did I have a lot of conversations during the day in the last few minutes. Did we just talk about census data at all? Or is that another call I just had? Yeah. Another call. So, okay. Right. <laughs> Sorry. That's my old age. Um, you know, one of the reasons I did all this and started the company, especially going so hard into education, right, which is direct to consumer, but also B2B sales training, um, is five years ago, I saw a stat that said 23% of all taxpayers in the United States are gig workers, hmm. right? Or record at least a portion of their income and record it in a 1099. Interesting. Right? So it's like the 80-20 rule. So today, yeah. It's 36 percent. Okay. By 2027, over 50 percent of the U.S. economy will come in part from gig work, which means that more and more people are rejecting higher education, more and more people are rejecting W-2s and nine to fives, and more and more people are figuring out that they just want to work for maybe 10 people and sell something, whether they know they're in sales or not. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and you know, one of our theses is to really get ahead of that, of that kind of worker industrial revolution mm -hmm. that'll come between now and 2030. So do you see this media company expanding beyond just training agents? Like, is this for other gig yeah. economy people? So the, so studios, um, uh, so far does, you know, brand deals, agent deals, still relatively real estate. We do some car stuff, yeah. very random, um, uh, uh, but sell it. So the education side, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, 22,000 members now in 126 countries. Um, and some of them are surgeons. Some of them are formula E race car drivers in South Korea. Yep. Some of them are selling pianos in Utah to other Mormons. Like okay. it's, some of them are, a lot of them are real estate, you know, some of them insurance, mortgage, like it's, and it's, uh, uh, and it's growing uh, much faster than we anticipated. So this is, is like a, this is like a uh, masterclass style video series that you kind of, it's more of like a, yeah, it's more of like a um, uh, uh, Peloton for sales training. Okay. Right, Salesforce for sales training. Yeah. Um, on demand or it's modulized yeah. course curriculum. Yeah. You learn how to sell. So, so, so yeah, so it's, so it's what you would call, and that's that kind of part of the world. It's, you know, asynchronous. So it's, mm -hmm. Hey, go learn how to do this, learn that you can do whatever you want. And there's also cohort. So you would do it with a live instructor. Oh, so a lot cool. of the B2B stuff is with live instructors. There's assessments like it's, it's real. And it becomes revenue intelligence for companies outside of just pure product intelligence where they're like, yeah, I know how to sell the software, but do you? <laughs> And so we're able to go there and do that. And it's a lot of the same muscle. And, you know, part of our, our, our founding is that, listen, we learn how to sell real estate in the streets of New York City, not having been here, not having grown up here with no leg up, figured out how to do this. I'll help you sell software, <laughs> you know, and our yeah. people will that we've trained. It's the same principles, you yeah. know, just, to, you know, yeah. Slightly different music and musicians. Yeah, talking to someone in person, uh, building your brand is, is somewhat different than working with like uh, an SDR at a software conglomerate 
trying to you know increase their sqls like there's a very yeah um there's some nuance there but it's uh uh but it all kind of comes down to uh um you know a core understanding of the sales process in the 2020s you know and our competitors there's like two of them globally and they are um uh uh you know they they're built on an, an economy from the 1990s it's yeah just different it's a different world i love it uh, what's the um what's the typical miss conception or misperception when someone comes in let's say maybe under your umbrella wants to build their brand i mean i can tell you what happens in our world because you know aside from this i have a production company we yes. create you know film and commercial stuff for clients yes and inevitably we'll get the client that's like i want to go viral yeah always and it's like everyone oh, wants overnight success ugh. yeah uh, so talk about some of those like okay here's what you're not going to get or like here's the heavy lifting you have to do before you yep. can build your brand like what are some of the building blocks hindsight's 2020 right as is success right you only realize you're successful in hindsight you don't realize you're successful now like i didn't know that 2018 was all was like an awesome year for me until it was over yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like i didn't I, I, I didn't know um uh and so you know we spend <laughs> a lot of time really training them on on having a macro vision um that's built with like micro wins Right? You have to be as specific as possible. Yes. So don't come in and just say, I want a huge brand. I want to go viral. I want to make a million dollars. Great. How? Yeah. Like literally, what will you do every day? Because you can't control a year and you can't control the dream. What you can control is what you do with the time during the year. And it's funny because um, uh, uh, last year, Harvard Business School came to me. And Never said, heard of them. And said, we're going <laughs> to, yeah, say we'd like to write a case study on you. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> like, what? Why? What are you gonna write about? Like the company? Like we're two. We're at that. You know, at that point, we we're two years old. You know, real estate, TV. What do you want to talk about? Like, no, no, no. Um, we're gonna write a case study on you and time management. And so they wrote a whole case study and they taught it at Harvard Business School about Ryan Serhant and time management. And I had no idea Pretty how cool. interesting that was for me. Um, you know, uh, I, as I think about it, you are a very punctual guy. I said, yes, I'm seven minutes late to this. Well, but we were in your house. I mean, I remember the last couple of times I've met you, you were like uh, spot on. The other thing I remember and very quotable from the first interview we did a couple of years ago is you can't do six crunches and expect six pack abs sure yeah i love that quote it still sticks in my mind i still like the quote that you put into that article where you compared me i had the, the physical prowess of of gronk with <laughs> yeah. a tight end um but with none of the athleticism <laughs> like my parents and my brothers that was the best interview they'd ever read about me and they still bring that up all the time like man that guy <laughs> was the brian elliott from dude that guy just understands you <laughs> I can just cut right through. I just, it's kind of like my thing. I can see yeah. see through. Yes. Yeah, anyway, carry on then. <laughs> I don't even know what we were just talking well, about. Well, you were telling me about the uh, time management. I'm oh, yeah, impressed yeah. with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The time management um, uh, is key. So Harvard Business School did the case study, which was which is fun. But it, um, uh, 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 I guess, it, you know, it really cut down to, to how I think about uh, achieving goals, right, and achieving success. So that when new agents come in, like you said, or new customers, and they have really, really high expectations, you know, you can walk them through what this process is. So if you wanna do something big for the year, no problem. How many minutes a day are you gonna put into it? Yeah. Um, and if you do that, right, then you can solve a problem literally one day at a time. I, I like this. I've heard James Clear talk about it and write about it. James yep. wrote that book, Atomic Habits. Yep, yep, yep. That's the whole premise of the book. You know, it's like tiny little wins. Yeah, of course. And a lot of people say, don't don't set your goals huge. Set them like bite sizable. Yep. So that you can just yum 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 like little yeah, yeah. Pac-Man and get them. You know, and then you could grow from there. But it's like start with a little micro wins. You're exactly. Yeah, that's uh, accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so it's right there. And I've always also thought about. Um, uh, time is money. Maybe it's because I'm a commissioned salesperson. Like I've never had a salary, I've never had benefits. Like I, 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 I just work all the time until someone else is successful, mm -hmm. and then hopefully maybe I take a small percentage of that. Yeah. And so, do you know what we call it on my side? We call it boats in the water. 
Sure. We have a lot of boats in the water. Yeah. They don't always all sail at the same time. Sure, yeah. But you gotta have a lot of boats in the water. Yep, yep, yep. And if you want to really, really be successful, then you burn your boats, right? Ah, yes. Yeah. Burn the boats, yes. You burn the boats, man, you cut the net. But I, uh, so I, so I created what was like, what I called my thousand minute rule like 10 years ago. Um, uh, uh, because I, I spent a lot of time, you know, having a bad conversation with someone or getting yelled at by a client or I don't know, like stepping in a pot, like it's, it's something would happen and it would then quote unquote ruin my day. Well, this just ruined my day. Mm -hmm. And it's something, if something really, really bad happens and in my world, in the sales world, bad things happen on Mondays because people have the weekend to think about it. And then on Mondays they're like, well, I'm not going to ruin his Sunday. So I'll call him on Monday. Yeah. So every Monday is like, what, what's going to happen today? <laughs> yeah. um, it would then potentially ruin your week. Yeah. But as I started to think about you know, having 1,440 minutes a day, a thousand of them I can be productive. Um, uh, uh, if someone ruins 15 of those, I wouldn't throw out $985. So every day I wake up as the CEO of my own bank of time and I go for it. And if I can buy some of that time back, holy moly. Yeah. Like the, the, the tech that we've built on the brokerage side that we actually announced and showcased for the first time ever at Inman yesterday on stage was the first time I've ever done that before. Totally terrifying. Um, uh, does that, you know, um, and it's really helping people get their time back so they can invest it back into the business or back into having more life. Yeah. Okay. So in recap, what you're saying is you need to manage expectations or manage your own expectations yeah. of being able to, you know, grow to whatever volume you're expecting, like manage those, focus on micro wins yeah. and then just start building brick by brick. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Yeah, you're not trying to, your goal isn't to grow muscle. Your goal is to pick up a heavier weight next week, more times than this week. Mm -hmm. That is something I can control, right? As well as what you eat and what you don't eat. Um, uh, same thing like what you do, you know, with your time and how you put that out there. So you want to build something viral. You're not going to do it once, right? You're going to do consistent content. So in the book, we go through core identity. Once you have that, then you build out consistent content. And then once you have that, you have to be your greatest champion. Mm -hmm. No one's going to talk about your successes if you don't talk about your successes. I love that Snoop Dogg speech. Have you heard it? I'm sure I'm you sure, have. Yeah. It's the uh, Snoop Dogg Hollywood Walk of Fame speech where yeah. he's thanking everyone. And he famously says, I want to thank me yeah. for all the hard work, work I put in. I yeah. want to thank me for believing in me yeah. when everyone else didn't. Yeah. I want to thank me you know what? for never giving up. Yeah. You know, the, the, the speech Iconic. that actually had real influence on me. Um, that I think a lot of people made fun of was Matthew McConaughey's Oscar speech for Dallas Buyers Club, where he got up there and everyone was like, oh, Matthew McConaughey is crazy. But he got up there and he thanked himself in the future. Yes. Right? And his role model is him in the future. And I like, I remember watching that all those years ago and it had a profound impact on how I think about who I work for, mm -hmm. you know? And then I went on one of those face apps and I aged myself to like 80, old man Ryan, and that guy's my boss because I will be that guy before I know it. Yeah. Like I'm almost, you know, I don't know, I moved, I, I moved to New York City yesterday, but that was now almost 20 years ago and now my back hurts and I'm like, shit. <laughs> like, okay, in the amount of time I've now been in New York City, I okay, so it's, I'm gonna be 60 now before I know it. And the same blink of an eye it's been since the day I got here, it'll be an, an even faster blink of an eye. Yeah before I turn 60 years old. Yeah. And so I want that guy's life to be great. Everything I do today is for me in the future. You know, future me, that guy, and Matthew McConaughey probably. Yeah, I'll build on that idea. That's like the, one of my favorite shows, The Office. That's the very end yeah. uh, scene where they say, uh, I think it was Andy who says, I wish I would have known that I was in the good old days. Yeah. When I was in the good old days. Yeah. Like we're in them right now. Yep. And like, the irony is, yeah, and the irony is, Ryan, like, if you and I are not here right now in the present, all in, and, like, given everything we got to this podcast right now, it's like, it's it's a waste. Yeah. And I think that's how I approach, you know, if you're talking about brand or if I talk about, you know, uh, making good use of time, it's like every single opportunity we have to be present with whoever we want to be present with could be our family, could be client be friends you know whatever it's like we have that chance and if we miss it we miss it yeah and that's it's now behind us yeah yeah man same thing like i i think about a lot you know 
10 years from today, you're going to wish you felt this tired. Right. <laughs> right? You're going to wish your little back pain yeah. that you had today. Is... Remember when I had hair? Oh, man, that was yeah. so great. And it's before, yeah. before you're like, you're going to, you know, I said, I talk about it to my wife all the time. Like, we look at photos of ourselves getting married and we're like, oh, God, we were so young. But I distinctly remember being there and being like, oh, man, we're getting married so old. <laughs> You know, it's all relative. You just, and it's hard. That's a hard thing to teach. I think you just have to uh, uh, just go out there and have as many experiences as you possibly can and just know that the future is creeping up on you. Yeah. Back to brand. So what do people get yeah. wrong about brand? Uh, what What if they're not walking the talk? I mean, I, sure. I'm looking at some of these chapters, you know, like, um, yeah. walk me through some of that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, there's, there's a lot of, uh, things to to not do. Yeah, no, I know what they are. But, um, uh, um, you know, I, kind of going back to what I what I said originally. Like, I would say that the biggest thing uh, uh, people make mistakes with is really not understanding what a brand is in the first place and thinking that it's purely something visual, right? Thinking that it's purely something visual. Um, on the product side, okay, what I really really love, and I learned this uh, uh, from a lot of different people, and I, I also interview a lot of people in the books. The first book I've ever done that before. Um, How was that? I took a page from your book. Um, it's uh, fun, right? It was interesting, man. Like I'd never, you know, because my first two books, this is all part of like a selling trilogy. So yeah. Sell Like Sirhan is the sales tools. Big Money Energy is the confidence to use those tools. And then Brand It Like Sirhan is, well, you can't sell anything if no one knows what you're selling. Mm -hmm. So put that all together, build a great sales career and whatever you want to sell. Um, but in this one, I thought, you know what? I can't write a, a, a great brand manual if I don't I talk to other people, you know, from the, all the classics, from like Gary Vaynerchuk to also, you know, Nick Sharma from Sharma Brands, who's just a genius at this stuff, to mm -hmm. um, uh, like, you know, Kenneth Cole, you know, talk about, you know, how do you build a socially aware brand mm -hmm. and, and everybody in between. Um, uh, because I wanted to talk to people that had actually done the work, not yeah. people who just have big brands and it just sort of happened. Did wanted... you learn something new? Yeah. So, so, so as far as product goes, you know, because some people don't want to have personal brands. That's fine. Their personal brand can be defined by the success of a product. You right. know, they're building a whatever that product might be. Yeah. And so he and we really go into the book and, and, and kind of dove in on what he said. Um, it's like one of the exercises we do with our companies is with brands. Every brand is a who, not a what. Mm -hmm. Kind of like we said. So we go, OK, this brand, who is she? What does she look like? OK, you want to sell a new brand of hammers. Is that hammer Martha? Yeah. There's a Tom. You create a muse. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you build out that whole character study. Call you a build persona out, sometimes. Yeah. You build out that persona, that character. Now with AI, you can actually kind of do that. Mm -hmm. Right? And your brand can now have an identity, can have a, can have a persona, can have a voice. Um, and most people just don't do that at all. Like, at all. Um, I think in part because they just don't want to do the work or they don't know. They haven't done the clarity. The other mistake a lot of people make is they believe in what they've already internalized. So I think I'm awesome. Right, right, right. right. I'm the greatest salesperson of all time. I am time. the king. Right, yeah. exactly. Without actually like doing the survey. So yeah, another exercise that. that we'll do is you go find a handful of people or one person that you believe will be completely honest with you and say, please define me without using my name and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So I did this a long time ago to my friend, Alex, who's kind of a dick, but <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Honest. He's honest. Okay. I was like, can you define me without using my name? He's like, what do you mean? I'm just like, just how would you explain me to somebody else? If you're gonna say, hey, I was just with the guy without using my name, how would you say it? He's like, yeah, you're kind of like the tall, lanky, awkwardly gray hair guy who thinks he's funny sometimes, but most of the time isn't. Um, and you look at the ground when you walk. And I was like, hey, gross. Okay. Thanks so much. That's it. That's all you would say. He's like, you, I don't know. I was, I, you know, he's, he's, he's nice. I'm like, okay, that doesn't help me. Um, and I kind of learned from that to take the best and leave the rest. You know, like I had dyed my hair, but I didn't realize. And I started asking a lot of people, like, I, I can't see my hair when I'm walking around, you know, and you get so used to it. Yeah. And so that's, it's a visual identity and a moniker that people, like really connect me to interesting though he didn't use many adjectives he didn't say like you know um no smart funny people are thoughtful. visual oh he yeah. said not as funny as i thought it was yeah. yeah um looking at the ground was a weird thing i was like really that's how he's like yeah yeah you're the guy that does that I'm like i'm the guy who 
looks at the ground when I walk. It's like, yeah, everyone says that. I'm like, what? I didn't even know that. Everyone does. Yeah. Go I, to the YouTube comments. Yeah. Come on. What? <laughs> yeah. And then, and so I did like a little bit of uh, uh, internal discovery. It was like, why do I, why do I do that? And I dug back and I dug deep. And what it was, was um, uh, when I was growing up, I had really, really bad skin. So I had rash acne and I would get embarrassed looking at people in the eye because their eyes would move around my face. Mm. And so it was easier for me to walk between classes, high school and college yeah. without making eye contact. So I would just walk with my eyes at the ground. And even when my skin cleared up and I got older, I never actually broke that muscle memory because mm -hmm. it just became like the way I walk. Yeah, old habits. Yeah. And, but it set a perception. Interesting. Right? Yeah. As part of my brand math that the world then had of me as somebody who was unconfident, someone who then also was potentially ignorant, someone who didn't want to make eye contact yes. with me because you don't, I don't have acne anymore. So people are like, oh, that guy's not making eye contact with me. Yeah. That guy's a jerk. And I, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very smart. I mean, we're talking about sort of nonverbal cues, yeah. uh, interpretations. Uh, that's relatable. Uh, oftentimes people will come up to me and say, are you okay? Are you upset? I have that RBF face sometimes. I'm in my head a lot. Yeah. Uh, so you're right. I mean, being conscious of nonverbal cues is yeah. really important to your yeah. brand. Sometimes you're communicating RBF. the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like sometimes I'm really in my head. I'm very introverted, actually, Ryan. Yeah. Even same. though I, you know, turn the lights on and I'm like, you know, fire plug. But it's yeah. like you're like me in front of the lights. We are on. Yeah. Lights off. I'm looking at the ground. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay. Um, it's you know it's funny. I did a I did a but the only movie I ever made was While We're Young. It's Noah Baumbach directed it uh, with Ben Stiller and Adam Driver and Amanda Seyfried and Naomi Watts and um, and stuff. And I I'd never been around people like that. And they cast me as a guy named Hedge Fund Dave. Um, <laughs> and you should watch it. It's funny. And he uh, 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 but anyway, so I had all these scenes with Ben. Um, and I you know. I grew up watching Ben Stiller. Yeah. And Ben's loud. He's funny all the time. When the camera's on, when the camera's off. Yes. He is silent. He's pretty quiet. He's super quiet. Yeah. Like in a corner. <laughs> I know. It was, it was a it was a wild experience for me. Um, he got upset with me, actually. Uh, when I was at Universal, I worked with him on Meet the Parents. Oh, really? That movie with De Niro. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know it, yeah. Yeah, and I came in all hot. Uh, you know, I was excited to meet him because I thought he was funny and I was yeah, like yeah. joshing around with him funny and he just looked super deadpan and he was, he didn't really answer me. And then the, his agent says, um, let's not talk to Mr. Stiller like that anymore. You know, like what was, was your role? What was your, what was your job then? I was on the brand strategy team helping with uh, the DVD ah. uh, after the movie came out theatrical and we had showed him this key art which is the cover of the art. And um, maybe had Im slightly in part to do that, we had him, a comp done like this bunny, like you ever see a Christmas story yeah. where the kid comes out in yeah, the bunny yeah. suit? So we put him in a bunny suit. Oh, good job. And I was like, this is hilarious. And he goes, no answer. I was like, oh, <laughs> I guess he doesn't like it. Uh, Did you use that? No, no, the agent said, you know, he's really trying to lean more into leading man role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we ended up putting bunny slippers on him in the comp. And that's what that's what made the, the cut. But um, no, I get great. it. You got to be careful. DVDs. Wow. Got to be careful. So let's go back to what you learned from all of these experts. You talked yep. to all these people who are running brands. Yep. Uh, what, what was the, one of the key takeaways? Oh, man, there was there was so many. Um, uh, I would say, you know, there's amazing there's an amazing woman who runs um, a company called August, which is like period awareness. Okay. okay. Yep. Um, and period power um, uh, and really kind of taking away any shame or embarrassment from periods because half the world has them. Of course. So uh, she was so like I, I would have in my interview with her, I could have stayed on there for 12 hours. Um, uh, she never would have done that because she's way too busy building a rock star company. But she um, uh, uh, she talked a significant amount about. Uh, the creation of community and community awareness in brand building and how it's not, you know, because the, the, the kind of phrase content to commerce has been used for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, yeah, we can create content. That's funny. We can create, you know, brand aware content about period, you know, tampons and yeah. pads and everything. Um, uh, uh, and then people will look at the content and they'll say, ha, 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 and maybe they'll buy it, right? Buy it. But um, given what you can do now on TikTok and Snap and across stories, Right, every brand 
even if it's tampons, is, is a character, right? It's a person and that yeah. person needs to, and your customer has to connect with it and you do it through community. So that, that math that I talked to you about of, it's no longer content to commerce, it's content to community to commerce, um, uh, was, was really, really eye-opening. Um, and that whole interview, you know, I really didn't edit a whole lot from it and is, is in the book because I thought it was super, super, super smart. She had a great way of really kind of building community awareness to create brand attention to the benefit of a booming business in a marketplace that I don't think a whole lot of people would say, hey, let's go disrupt feminine products, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, uh, 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 and she has, it was super cool. It's smart. I mean, it, disruption is the key, right? You're trying to differentiate yourself from all the other real estate agents. Yeah. You're a real estate agent and a media company. Uh, I think about other, uh, like liquid death is one of my favorites right now is yeah, disrupting sure. water. It's yeah. like, I remember when Stance did it with socks and yeah. Liquid Death doing it with water. It's like, yeah, it's cool. Where, where do you see white space? Like, where's where's the Sirhan brand lasering focus now? I, I still think there's a lot, and we're working on some things. Um, I, th I still think that real estate is relatively pretty boring. Like the houses are cool, but no one has done for real estate sales what Liquid Death has done for water or Logan and KSI have done for for drinks you know yeah. or, or um uh uh so i think there's 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 a lot of things that we can do there i think there's white space there um i think there's white space and furniture um i think there's i think restoration hardware is beautiful i think it's super cool i think it's super expensive mm -hmm. um i think ikea has been around for a long long time mm -hmm. and i think there is a mass market changing of the guard that should mm. be taken and i don't think anyone is as far as I know, I'm sure there are people trying, so I apologize to anyone who's trying. I just haven't seen it yet personally. Um, I think there's a huge, huge marketplace because all I know is all people did over the last couple of years is move and buy houses and there is no furniture. Can't get it. Sir Hand you know? Home Furnishings. Yeah. Yeah. Sir Hand Sleep. Sir Hand Sofa. Hey, listen, Ralph Lauren did it. Yeah. Why not Ryan Sir Hand? Sure. Oh my God. One thing at a time. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think that's. That's a that's a good white space where you could do a lot. And people have dabbled in furniture, and it's always hard. But it's because they try to do too much. Like you've got to start simple, right? Like if you look at Liquid Death, it's one can, looks the same. It's water. Mm -hmm. if you look at Prime, right? They start with the one drink, right? If you look at anything else, they start with the one thing. What would you start with? Would, would it be a sofa? Would it be a bed? I would uh... Start with no, because I think there's there's I don't want, I wouldn't want to compete right away with with mattress companies, right? Um, or like bedding companies. Like I don't need to go to battle with Casper or Serta or yeah, or like Brooklyn Inn or any of those. I think I'm um, uh, 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 I don't know. Like I I think like. There should be like the table and chairs. Yeah. Um, well, and, you know, Stickley and some of those old, like they're a hundred year old brands. Yeah. Like, these guys are like. Yes. I mean, if you're not in a furniture, you don't know what Stickley is. But sure. it's like, would you reinvent that category? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Like, I think there's a huge, huge marketplace for it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very much on the the mass market side of the business okay you know i think they're um not you wouldn't go high in luxury you'd go mass i don't from for me i don't think so um uh you know i like i like doing things for a lot of people mm -hmm. on the real estate side you know me personally i only operate in the luxury space yeah there's only so much time but the firm i mean we sell everything you know at all price points in all markets yeah you know i gotta be in like south carolina on Friday, I think we have like uh, National Home Builder, you know, selling track land lots. And then on um, that Saturday, I gotta be in Savannah. You know, these are relatively normal markets. Yeah. Um, uh, which is cool. It's all, listen, it's all volume at the end of the day. Let's wrap things up by maybe uh, leaving some uh, words of wisdom, some pieces of advice. Yeah. People building their brand. Uh, pull it right from the pages of the book. I, I, I did not need to write a book, right? I didn't need, I didn't need to write the first two. Um, but I had, there's like, I had such a deep itch to put this out there. Um, and it really completes that flywheel for me, you know, after the first two books. And they all, they're all the same, I mean, they're all me. So they all operate together. Um, but I am just so, 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 so uh, excited about all the opportunities that people have today to build something for themselves even five years ago, right? It was, it was so much harder then to create something new 
compared to what it is today. Uh, let me ask you about that too. It's like, what is simply like a deeply held belief you had five years ago about business or about yourself or you know that category that you no longer believe? Things have changed. Five years ago, well, that's a loaded question. Um, five years ago, I believed you had to be a jack of all trades if you wanted to be successful. You had to understand all the individual pieces of the widget, right? You had to know everything about something and something about everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that's fine. Today, given the advancements in technology, given the efficiencies that have now been created through AI, which have reduced you know, engineer and legal workforces for the better or worse, um, uh, given the innovation and the global marketplace we have, I'm actually a much bigger believer today in just being uniquely qualified to doing what you do best and going all in, like we talked about an hour ago, going all in on what you, you are uniquely qualified to do um, and then diversifying and leveraging yourself out amongst people who are way more qualified than you are at those individual things. Um, because I would rather be everything to someone than, than nothing to no one. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up. Reminiscing about the good old days and all that, you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going.